Welcome everybody uh, to Senate Education Thursday, January 11th. Uh, we are doing some bill introductions today and we have, uh, so we have about 10 or 15 minutes with each of them. We may not need that much time. We may have some breaks uh, here and there, which would be great. But we're going to start with uh, Senator Gulick's bill, S203, which is in our folders. And S203 is a bill, an act relating to the appointment of the State Board of Education members. And I'm wondering, Senator Gulick, do you want to say a few words? And I, then we do have St. Dust St. James here to take us through the bill. She's up Wonderful. there somewhere. She's yeah. up there. Okay, great. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for putting in the bill. Hello, everybody. And um, thank you, Senator Campion, for pronouncing my name correctly. You're one of the few people that can do that. So yeah. thanks. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> so this is S203. And this is something, um, it just it came to my mind as I was thinking about education in Vermont and how the ED fund is such a such a behemoth in terms of um, you know taxpayer dollars in the billions of dollars and how you know we the legislature and the agency of education are tasked with you know education in Vermont and making sure that it is um, equitable and high quality um, while also keeping an eye on the cost and the outcomes. So it got me thinking about what an incredibly important role that we all have in education. Um, and as I was looking at the state board and thinking about how the state board is made up and who makes it up, um, the members of the board are appointed exclusively by the governor. And it seems as though this should be a shared responsibility um, in the legislature as well. So that's what this bill uh, does is it creates a new appointment process. So um, instead of having the governor appoint all of the members of the state board, it would, as you can see, and I know Beth is gonna take us through, um, but if you go to um, section one, and as as Miss St. James likes to say, this is all in statute um, title 16 BSA, which is where all the education um, information and, and statutes are, et cetera. Um, and subsection 161. And so this would have the 10 members of the board be comprised of someone with experience as a principal, a superintendent, a teacher, a school board member, someone in the educator preparation program, mm. um, a special educator, and a parent. Um, and the governor would be able, oh, sorry, I shouldn't forget the students. Two of the members shall be secondary students enrolled in a public school, approved independent school, or secondary career technical education center. And one of those um, secondary students is a full member and does have a vote, and then there's a junior member who does not have a vote. So under this new appointment methodology, four members um, shall be appointed by the governor, including the two uh, second, uh, sorry, the both secondary student members. So um, ostensibly the governor would end up with three um, appointments that are that are folks who, who vote. Um, and then the uh, Senate committee on committees would be, um, the, that would be the mechanism for appointing three members. And the House, the Speaker of the House would also have the, um, charge of appointing three members those members would all come through the committees so the ones that would be sent to the committee on committees would come from senate education mm -hmm. and the one um, that would go from the speaker of the house would go through house education and right now folks who are on the board would see their um, appointments through to the end their terms sorry through to the end and then um, there's a what i think is a pretty good process to kind of start the the reappointment which you would find on um, this is on page four it sets up a whole uh, plan of how 
these new appointments would work. So, for example, um, for the terms that are expiring in 2025, one shall be made uh, by the Senate Committee on Committees and one shall be made by the Speaker of the House. And then it goes on to continue in 2027, 2028, 29, and 30, um, alternating, you know, who gets the appointments. And then ultimately you would, you would have everyone who has at that point been appointed under this new system. Um, so that's basically the building, of uh, the building, that's basically this bill in a nutshell, and the effective right. date is July 1st of 2024. Any questions? Senator Starr, are you okay with time? If we, if we if, if, do, you, do you mind? It's, we're going to be about 10 minutes on this bill. Does this does that work for you? Yeah. Okay. I'm all right. Bye. Yeah, I'll just shorten your appropriate. <laughs> that's, what, <laughs> that's why I asked. <laughs> no, I, I put right. in my chair that I have to All right. Thanks. Help. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Senator Dulick? Uh, the bill. Yeah, please. Just uh, more curiosity. So there were ten. There are ten members now. There will be ten members if this bill is successful. But one becomes a non-voting member. Does that change? Of that's correct, right? Yeah, that's currently the way it is as well. Oh, it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. With, oh, I see. The so junior so student right. member is a non-voting right. member. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thank yeah. you for the question. Yeah. yeah. So actually, I, I think. Um, I mean, I, I'm a coast sponsor so obviously I support this. I'm, I am curious, um, when it comes to appointing one member who's a parent, I'm, what are, how will that be figured out? I mean, a parent, like what, will there be any other um, qualifications or just any random Vermont parent? Sorry. Um, I guess any random Vermont parent who is interested in serving. Okay. Yeah. Is there a parent? Do we have that now? I mean, there might, I think there are parents on there, but they're not um, necessarily, maybe not have applied as a parent. Who appoints the parent? Is that the, um, or does it not matter? It's more like we could do it, the governor could do it, Correct. the house could do it. Okay, yeah. this is great. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, Senator Williams. I'm thinking about the uh, process we went through in, in health and welfare where the vice chair got a list of names together for potential. We went out and brought them in. Is that something that the education committee would be involved with? That's a great question. Um, Senator Weeks was really organized us in health and welfare and put together a color-coded spreadsheet and we contact the <coughs> folks and we ask them if they would be, these are folks who were already on committees, I so, believe, and we were asking if they wanted to be reappointed, which in the case of the State Board of Ed, these folks serve out their six years, I believe it is, and then they can't run again. So you just get the one term. Um, but we could certainly set up a system that might be similar to that. Well, the reason I'm asking is because uh, we just recommended people from the committee to the governor. Right. And the governor appointed and what happened was we waited till the end of the session and people that were already fulfilling that uh, board responsibility were already functioning in capacity before they were appointed right so is this going to take on the same process as as right. the one we had i think possible. so yeah i think so so is that likely to, given yeah. given the process is right. that likely to so you're serving yeah, and then before you're confirmed. Before you're actually confirmed, yeah. And even judges, I was on judicial nominating this summer. Uh, we put forward a bunch of judge you know, names. The governor chose them. They were sworn in, but they still have to go through the Senate for confirmation. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, related to um, Senate 203, what's the rationalization for the change? Like, what's the basis for, besides a different approach, new concept. Was the problem a we're trying to solve? Piece? What's the problem we're trying to solve? Yes. Um, as I said before, it just to me, um, we're charged with this incredibly important job and this task, um, not just in terms of finances, in terms of the overall budget of the state, but also in terms of oversight with Senate education and House education, as well as the AOE and the governor. And it just seemed like it was, you know, it was a very consolidated 
process, just having one person make these appointments seem to fit better with the model that we have in terms of Senate education and House education to um, share in the process. So make it more equitable. I guess I, equity is something, I, it's a word I use a lot and a term that's important to me and just seem like it would be more equitable to spread that work out. Thank you. Yes. Is there any cost to this? <clears throat> no. I, I mean, I say that, I not to my knowledge. We can always get a fiscal note, but I don't see, yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Senator Dulick? Ms. St. James, do you mind doing a walkthrough and then we'll move to Senator Starr? Sure, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Uh, Senator Gulick did a great job of walking you through the bill already. I will um, just try and highlight the highlights. So this is a change to how our board members are appointed for the State Board of Education and the expertise which is required for those appointments. Currently there is a, um, in statute, um, and this bill doesn't touch that, there's a kind of hopeful statement that to the extent possible members shall represent the state's geographic, gender, racial, and ethnic diversity, but there's no other requirements. This bill adds um, a requirement that members have expertise uh, in certain areas, um, and then it really doesn't touch the student um, members other than to be explicit that they may be from a public school, an approved independent school, or a secondary career technical education center. Currently, as Senator Gulick mentioned, all State Board of Education um, uh, members are appointed by the governor, and this bill proposes to change how those appointments are made. So it would mean four members appointed by the governor, and that includes the two student members. So it would be two student members and two non-student members appointed by the governor, and then three members each for the House and the Senate. And the way that, that those appointments occur is that the Senate Committee on Committees makes the appointment, but they choose the name that they are appointing from among not fewer than six candidates proposed by the Senate Committee on Education. And it's the same process for the House. It's the Speaker and then the House Committee on Education. So you all would be tasked with proposing not fewer than six candidates to fill an open seat. And then the Senate Committee on Committees would make those appointments. Um, there, For the governor appointees, there is no requirement that there be any um, confirmation by the Senate. So it's just a governor appointee. Um, and then depending on who made the initial appointment, so if a member is appointed by the House, the House would continue to appoint someone to fill a vacancy in that chair. So whether that's the expiration of a term or someone leaving the term early, whoever made the original appointment, this bill proposes that they stick with that seat. Um, I'm just looking, let's see. Um, if there is a vacancy, I'm on page three, line seven. Um, if the Senate or the House filled that vacancy originally, they're gonna stick with that seat. But the vacancy should be filled by choosing from a, among the original list of candidates for the vacant term proposed by the applicable committee of jurisdiction. Um, so let's jump to the transition period. Um, obviously, you don't need to. You don't need to do anything, right? You're the legislature. You can do whatever you want. But um, this bill contemplates a transition period, right? How do we go from all governor appointees to this staggered approach? And so I won't go through each, but I all I did was I, I took the terms of each board and when they expire, and then I just went, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, four um, appointments. And so um, this does not talk about the transition period currently, and this bill is introduced, does not bake in what qualification, like special education, parent, teacher, superintendent, those new qualifications that we're adding on page one of the bill. The transition period doesn't um, propose that any vacancy has to match any particular qualification. So, um, I think in the real world, how this would play out is for the first appointment, if that was a teacher, that qualification's off the board for the next appointment and so on. You could, should you choose to take up this bill, get more prescriptive in that the first appointment needs to be a teacher, the second appointment needs to be a special education professional, et cetera. 
Um, and then the bill, uh, and then um, once that initial appointment is made, again, the appointing authority keeps that seat. Um, and then this bill is proposed to take effect on July 1 of this year. Thank you, Ms. St. James. Uh, I think we'll, we're gonna shift since we have Senator Starr here, but we can return to this uh, later this afternoon if anybody has any additional questions. And I have a list of potential witnesses. So, Senator Starr. And I don't know if everyone knows this, but Senator Starr was, you were the chair of this committee. Uh, yeah, back in maybe 10 or 12, uh, 2010 or 12. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I served all four years prior to that on this committee and, and when I first came to the legislature. And, um, you know, to start out with, um, I spent um, 21 years on the school board uh, in Lutroy as well as uh, served as chair of the supervisor union. And so education has always been a big part of my extracurricular activities, you might say. And, um, and spent a lot of time um, uh, helping to improve our educational system uh, in my district. Once I got here, um, we were, I, I represented five towns in, in, when I was in the house for 26 years. Uh, and every one of my schools uh, in my district were rebuilt. Uh, to new schools. So we, it's not a we uh, you know, did a good job uh, up north uh, improving our education system. And uh, so I've always been very interested in how education is gone and especially in our rural communities where dollars are short and costs are high um, figuring out ways to, to help with that this uh, over the years our uh, literacy uh, has dropped in our schools we used to be basically at the top of the ladder uh, or pretty close to the top, uh, and we're, you know, midpoint now. You know, we're we're losing that. And when this Dolly Parton uh, literacy program came along, um, you know, there's always new things popping up, and uh, you take it with a grain of salt and you watch how it goes. And uh, over the years, uh, at this point, they're doing, this is for children uh, from zero to, through their fourth uh, year. And the books are all sent out. And, and I have copies of them, or, or a couple of copies in that you can yeah, do you mind passing those around just so we can see the kinds of stuff? And the one um, that uh, on my right, that was put together by a guy from West Vermont. And uh, uh, but they, they send out now over a million books a month to these young youngsters uh, in our country plus four others. So it's, uh, it's pretty uh, well uh, distributed nationwide. And uh, the, uh, in my district, um, my Senate district, I believe, um, well in Vermont we have about 5,900 children that are enrolled in this program. And there's, uh, 17 different affiliates throughout the, the state that 
Um, what happens is the books are free, but the postage and the, uh, the handling, there's a small fee that costs about 20 six or seven dollars a child per year to cover that that and uh, in my district uh, pretty fortunate that um, in the last two 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 and a half years um, about every town in my senatorial district we've gotten signed up and children from each of those towns. And uh, you take, uh, uh, there's, like in Maine, there's 4,400 children. Uh, in Connecticut, 5,700 children. And in, uh, in Vermont, uh, we, uh, we have, uh, we're at the top of the list. But we we don't have any state affiliate to uh, to kind of look after this, and in some states um, they have a library department look after it, and we'll sort of spearhead it. And when uh, when I thought about it, the problem is in educating our children once they get to preschool or first grade. Why wouldn't this be better administered? The library has no money. And I mean, you folks know as well as I that we're spending 2.2, 2.3 billion dollars to educate our children K through 12, preschool through 12. And uh, in this bill, there's uh, an appropriation of $100,000. Well, you try to get 100000 out of the library or add to the library uh, department, it's a pretty big lift. But to squeeze 100000 out of $2.2 billion, um, or find it, um, you know, it just seemed to me that if you want money, you got to go where there is some, or it's not going to work. And um, so anyways, um, you know, we have, we have a good enrollment in this, and like up north, we're two years into the program. Uh, if we do this pilot for three years, uh, then we've got one group of young people, children, that have started at zero age and have gotten to the first grade. So there's, if you add three, we would have uh, one whole group that has completed uh, their five years, four years of, of uh, participating in this program, and we could measure it to see whether there's uh, been improvements or or not if the children enrolled in this program. And you take uh, middle class families. Um, they're uh, four times more likely to read to their children if they have these books there. And the big difference is on the lower income families, uh, they're eight times more apt to read to their children if these books are in the household. And it, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty obvious that uh, that lower income, um, they have no books at all. 61% of the lower income families have no children's books in their household. 
whatsoever. And so, uh, as, as the children grow uh, with the program, the books come in the children's name. So they're the owners of the books, the children are. And it, it seems that if you give ownership to your child of certain things, they learn to take better care of it because it's theirs. And uh, so that helps in, in the processes as well. Um, it, and I think you folks know uh, that by the time the child gets to the third grade, if they aren't doing well in their literacy, uh, reading abilities and skills, they're in trouble. And if you track that, which I spent years on the school board, and, and if these same children that score low in the third grade, they're also scoring low in their later years uh, in school. And, and then we also know uh, from facts that low scoring children in literacy also uh, drop out of school. Uh, they become delinquent and, and get into trouble um, that then get, they uh, get incarcerated. And you know, it, it just adds to, to their problems as, as they grow older. And I just felt that, uh, you know, we take my little simple bill uh, and get this thing started. Uh, yeah, it's going to cost us a little money, but any time with any problem you have, if you can, the quicker you nip it in the bud, uh, the cheaper it is. And if you let it, just let it keep going, it's, it gets worse, and our own scores uh, prove that. And, you know, my bill was, uh, was put together, uh, it's short, uh, fairly uh, quick. And there needs to be some changes to it. And where it says Vermont Imaginary Library, it should be uh, DPL or Dolly Parton Imaginary li uh, Library. But the, the main thrust of the bill is to get a statewide affiliate, uh, which I proposed in here that would be a Department of Ed instead of uh, the different uh, civic groups and different library uh, groups from all over the state and, and broaden this out so that it would, uh, would cover more children uh, from uh, a bigger part of our state. Um, you know, we've done well up north with it and Caledonia, as well as Caledonia and Lamoille County. Uh, but Washington County doesn't have an affiliate here. And we had a child move. Are you on a time limit? Uh, I do have to be in Seneca operations at 2.30. Okay, okay, good. So uh, we had a child move from our area to the Washington County area, and there was no affiliate to, to help with the postage and, and uh, handling. And we figured out a way to cover that from hours up, up north, but it, um, it would, I think we could get more children uh, involved in this and you know you haven't got to save too many of them to make this thing pay 
10, 10 fold and, uh, or more. Well, and one of the things I have so much respect for Bobby for is that he always goes into those early ages, Senator Starr, whether it's feeding well, kids or getting them to read, and you recognize that those early, and your work on kindergarten up north, um, recognizing that those early ages really make a huge difference. Oh, down the road. Down the road, yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Anderson, do you mind just pulling your chair up? Sure. Uh, and sit with Senator Starr and maybe take us through, and the two of you can, we have Senator Collimore coming in in about 10 minutes, uh, so we still have a little time. Does that work for you, Senator Starr, for him to? Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Non-savory character. Right. right. <laughs> for the record, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Am I just taking us through? Absolutely. Great. So thanks. for the record, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council, I haven't worked with you in the past. It's lovely to work with you today. Thank um, you. Look forward to working with you again in the future. Uh, S200, Senator Starr's bill, establishes the Vermont Imagination Library. Good point to pause and state that the reason it's called the Vermont Imagination Library here was because this has come up in the past and there was a little hesitancy about attaching a specific person's name to the program in case there was some sort of controversy in the future. You could always change it to the Dolly Parton Imagination Library if that's the will of the legislature. Well, Dolly is, fingers crossed, we'll ask. We'll see if we'll get her to zoom in. <laughs> Why not? Wow. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's done so much with this yeah. program. It'd be great to thank her and understand a little bit more about the program. Uh, the bill establishes a three-year pilot program for the Imagination Library. So it would exist for three years, an initial appropriation of $100,000 to fund the operations of the program. All of the duties that are assigned in the bill are uh, assigned to the Agency of Education. Um, essentially, the agency would be required to coordinate with the representatives from the Dolly Parton Imagination Library to implement the program throughout the state. Um, they would be required to manage the daily operations of the Imagination Library for purposes of the state, and that would include monitoring and um, overseeing the special fund that's created here where the state is going to put the $100,000. Um, as Senator Starr pointed out, there are states where there are intermediary nonprofits that act as the statewide partner with the Dolly Parton Imagination Library. Here, the state itself is just going to be the party that interacts directly with the program. The agency would be required to, and I'm on page two now, I'm moving slightly yes. quicker than I would because I actually only have five minutes before I have to leave now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're required to uh, create a public awareness program to make sure that uh, guardians and parents know that this exists and they can sign up and get free books. Um, they are, and I see all of them. Corrected. Required to uh, create a public awareness program um, that uh, makes people aware of the opportunity to donate to the special fund. Mm -hmm. This is also something that's been discussed in the past, um, whether the state wants to be soliciting donations, essentially, mm -hmm. into a state fund for this purpose, but it's there. Um, this is there, allows- Is there a precedent? Uh, there are some precedents, particularly where the state acts as a trustee over certain funds there, I can point you to couple different examples where public trusts are allowed to solicit donations. Libraries are one area in particular where you see a lot uh, of this. So trust libraries at the local level are allowed to solicit donations. Um, there's provisions in here for consultation with the Librarian of Congress. Uh, that would be the Secretary of Education who would be coordinating with the li Librarian of Congress. Uh, subsection C establishes that the eligibility for the program is any person under five years of age is eligible, provided that they're a resident of Vermont. Uh, there's a provision in subsection D that allows the agency of education to collect some administrative cost from the fund if that's necessary. Subsection E sets out that this is actually a 50-50 match. The $100,000 is matched by the Dolly Park Imagination Library. So you're dealing with $200,000 for the three-year period that can be spent to implement this program statewide. Um, there's a catch-all and a little bit of a security blanket here on page three in subsection F that if the General Assembly doesn't actually appropriate any funds to the special fund that supports the Imagination Library, 
uh, that this uh, shall cease, uh, that they shall cease to operate. And I was going to recommend striking that section. The road. So that it would be on the minute. There's a technical correction that needs to happen yeah. there, too. Okay. Uh, but there's a required report annually during the pilot period uh, to allow the Senate Committee on Education, the House Committee on Education, to see what is happening with the program, what the status is, how the money is being spent. Uh, and there is a repeal section here um, that the agency will include in its report a recommendation as to whether the program should cease to exist. Section 4202, page three establishes the special fund. Um, this is somewhat boilerplate <laughs> language for this. Um, subsection B, which is on page four, is the provision I was talking about where the agency would be permitted to accept gifts and donations, soliciting them, etc. Section two contains the $100,000 appropriation. Section three is the sunset, because this is a pilot program. So three years from July 1st, 2024, July 1st, 2027. That's the type of math I'm really good at. The effective date is July 1st, 2024. This is terrific. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, my pleasure. Thank you, Senator Starr. We may have you back in at some point to answer some questions. Um, any pressing questions right now, only because uh, Beth St. James doesn't have a lot of time to take us through the next bill. We can hold, I can hold my questions okay. until next time. Okay, okay. that'd yeah. be great. Yeah. Great. Well, you know, thinking about the agency of libraries. Yeah. Doesn't have any money, but there's money tied to it. Right, right, and, right. And that's really right down there, Allie? Yeah. Yeah, so something to think Yeah, I, I, I did spend did you? quite a lot of time thinking about it. Good. And it's, they're so, they're very small, mm -hmm. our departmental libraries. And, you know, they would have to basically hire somebody to look after this. And, I just felt that it, this is a main, it's a very major issue that our education department should be very concerned and should be sponsoring you know, their own budget, but they aren't. And yeah, you know, that would be the proper place uh, to, to do this. And, and I don't want to take a lot of your time, but um, I, I've been here a long time, and I've never supported a bill and promoted a bill that didn't pay off for the people of Vermont and uh, big time, and whether, you know, not a lot in, in this, uh, yeah, but this could save the state of Vermont millions of dollars down the road and help our workforce, uh, help young people uh, to complete school. And it's just sad that, <coughs> that we spend all this money getting children uh, to the ninth or to their 16th birthday. Right. I mean, we spend hundreds of thousands to get them there, and they walk out the door because they're frustrated because they don't understand the English language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, it it just makes sense to me, uh, from business point of view, to the welfare of our citizen, that something like this would would pay back many times over. So, Thank you so uh, much. Just on so a great. quick note, yeah. last year we spent, uh, I proposed to the Appropriations Committee that we spend uh, two, two million dollars on helping farmers pay the DNC payment in that pass. <laughs> um, we spent $2 million and we got back $29 million. Wow. So um, 
I could go on and tell you many of these strange stories. But <laughs> uh, if this wasn't worthy of the hundred thousand dollars, I wouldn't be here asking for it. So anyway, Great. Thank thanks, you. Bobby. Thank you, uh, awesome. thank you very much. Senator Collimore. Yes, sir. You mind joining us? And we have Ms. St. James before she leaves. Uh, she's going to take us through 216 quickly. Ask all questions. I'm sorry. I didn't. Mr. Chair, I've got a bug in my ear. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Uh, Senator Collimore, Ms. St. James has a, another meeting uh, in about five minutes. So we're going to start with her. You stay right there. Sure. She's going to take us through a high level of S216, which is in our folders. Uh, and um, I see that we have column. This is a bill that Senator Collimore has sponsored, and uh, Weeks and Williams are co sponsors. So, Beth, as much time as you can, uh, if you would take us, that would be great. Sure, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel. Um, I do only have five, about five minutes left, so this will be high level. If there are specific details you'd like me to come back in on, you know where I live. Great. Um, uh, so the, the first section here um, does away with the position of chancellor at the Vermont State Colleges Corporation. And one thing I just want to say from the, the outset is something for you all to think about this session is I, in my drafting life as a member of Legislative Council um, and all of my colleagues, um, there's been a lot of confusion over the change of the name of the Vermont State University and the Vermont and and how that fits into the Vermont State Colleges Corporation, because that name is sprinkled. The Vermont State Colleges is sprinkled throughout uh, the green books in various different places. And so whether you take this bill up or not, it may be a good idea to think about looking at the Vermont State Colleges statutes and see if there's any cleanup that needs to be done there. And there is a section of this bill that provides for that on just What's the name of this institution going forward and how should it be used throughout the green books? Technically speaking, I don't think there's any change necessary because the Vermont State Colleges Corporation is comprised of the institutions it is comprised of. So it would naturally sweep in the Vermont State University and the um, community college system. But we're not the only ones who use the green books. <laughs> um, and so there's just been a lot of confusion over what to call them what to call this institution. So just doing a plug for a little cleanup um, or at least a thought towards that. So section one, again, does away with the position of chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges Corporation, which again, right now is comprised of Vermont State University and CCB. Um, and the um, statute currently, section one is the is current law. Um, uh, it currently provides for a president for each institution under its control. Um, and so that doesn't change this. This bill does not propose to change that. So the structure would just be two presidents um, and no chancellor. The second section of this bill is a change to the um, a, the trustees, the board of trustees. So currently there are amongst other other trustee members, four legislative trustees. This bill proposes to strike that down to two and in their place have one faculty member trustee and one staff member trustee. Um, and those um, folks would be appointed by um, essentially the unions representing staff or faculty. And then, um, and then um, a lot of this bill is conforming amendments. So starting on page five, again, there's many places and, and this is, um, uh, there's many places throughout the cream books where the state colleges are referenced. And so there's um, conforming amendments um, when there's the mention of the ch chancellor, the position of chancellor. And if you choose to take up this bill, these sections um, I would suggest deserve some thought because it may not be a one for one swap of a president or both presidents for the chancellor. Um, but I don't, based on time and where you are with this bill, I don't think we're gonna go into each conforming amendment, but just know that some since this bill does away with the position of chancellor, there would need to be a lot of cleanup on anywhere that the chancellor's mentioned. Um, and I'm gonna jump to 
Um, page 10, line one, section 10, is that conforming revisions section that I made a plug for. I'm not so sure um, that what I have suggested here is really what you should go with, but it's a start of the conversation. Um, and this is just directing ledge council to make conforming amendments um, based on your direction. Um, and then there is section 11, page 10, line 10, um, a change to, we walked through this a little bit at the very end of last session, the um, directive to um, the Vermont State Colleges um, in their uh, structural deficit reduction and all of the work the legislator asked, legislature asked them to do. One of the things they asked them to do was to reduce their structural deficit by $5 million per year um, uh, through the end of fiscal year 2026 for a total of 25 million. What this bill does is it um, kind of prorates what's left. So this um, Act 74 um, was enacted in 2021. So there's already been a couple years of these structural deficit reductions. So this bill proposes to for fiscal year 2025, instead of a $5 million savings, it's asking for a 3 million. And then in fiscal year 2026, a oh, 1.5 million. Um, and then the effective date of this bill would be July 1, 2024. And that is all the time I have. Any immediate questions for Ms. St. James before we hear from the lead sponsor and others? St. James, I believe you need to leave. So yes. uh, thank you. We have, thank uh, you. we're in good hands with Senator Colin Moore. And um, yep. And if you wouldn't mind just taking us through a little bit, your thoughts, sure. the genesis of this, all that kind of thing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess Beth's already gone, but I was going to thank her, too. Um, so for the record, Brian Collimore, State Senator from Rutland County. Uh, this bill was drafted as a response to a meeting that was held at Castleton University on October 29, 2023. It was attended by about 10 of the area legislators for Rutland County, which is where Castleton is, but it was also attended by Senator Campion, who was from Bennington County and uh, made the trip up that day, and I believe took a tour of the campus afterward, and uh, it was great, and I thank him very much for uh, being willing to join us that day. During that meeting, there was a list of asks uh, presented to legislators, and three of those are represented in S216. And Beth has done a really good job going through those. Uh, I have maybe a little bit more to say about each, but uh, that's okay. That's where I came up with the idea. So we met, again, it was a legislative breakfast. There was faculty and staff are there. I'm gonna guess probably in both the uh, senators, or actually, I don't think Senator Weeks was available at the time, but Senator Williams was there. So there may have been 25, 30 people in the room, something like that. We had breakfast and then we listened to uh, a group of professors and staff address us, and that's where the requests came from. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, the Vermont, and this is from their own website, so we'll just go through it. Uh, VTSU, which is a Vermont State University, budgeted for an overall dip in enrollment of 6% and a new student enrollment dip of 15% in the current year. So we're not in a position which is sustainable unless we reverse that number. In other words, we don't want a continuing situation with fewer and fewer students enrolling each year. We want it to go the other way and we want to attract more students in. But in total, the Vermont State University system enrolls about 5,200 students. Uh, this is 4,000 undergraduates, about 500 graduate students, and then also 700 in what are called apprenticeship programs. Full-time students are 72%, part-time 28%. In-state, and this is important, I think, to remember, is about 72% of the uh, students that attend uh, the Vermont State University system are from Vermont, which leaves 28% out of state. And the uh, other important aspect, I think, of this is that the, uh, the students represent 47%, so nearly half of them are first-in-family students. 
and this is a role that is not the same that the University of Vermont or some of the private institutions in the state uh, can talk about, but the Vermont State University system does see it, I think, as their, one of their missions is to involve people who have never gone to college before, never been in that situation, and they're first in their family to do that. So I think it's an important niche that we remember that that's what we're talking about. I always thought, for some reason, that Castleton University had the biggest group of folks, and I think they do student-wise, but not acreage. So uh, let me just look down. Randolph is the largest campus that we have, 590 acres, and there's 30 buildings, including a brand new laboratory down there. Uh, Johnson is second with 350 acres and 14 buildings. Linden is third with 211 acres and 24 buildings. And Castleton is fourth with only 165 acres but 21 buildings. And then Williston, which is sort of a, an adjunct, if you will, to the, uh, the Johnson campus of 12 acres and seven buildings. Out-of-state tuition and fees, $26,000 a year. In-state is about $12,000 a year, and there is financial aid available. So, the first provision as uh, Ledge Council presented would eliminate the position of chancellor. Many in the Castleton meeting that day back in October, and I assume statewide as well since I've been in touch with some of the folks from the other campuses, question whether a quarter of a million dollar salary which is what the chancellor makes, is appropriate for a system that only serves about 4,700 students. In other words, in the scheme of things, there are much larger institutions nationwide with many more students. We have, you know, on balance, a pretty small institution here in terms of the uh, number of students. And there is now one president for the five campuses and then one president for the Community College of Vermont. So in essence, there are two, two presidents that represent the entire system. Those presidents at the moment report to the chancellor. So in terms of the uh, going up the ladder, that's the, the next person that they would report to. And then that person, and we have a new chancellor, of course, that was just recently hired, reports to the 15 members of the Board of Trustees. So that's how it goes. The president, and at one point there was a president on each of the campuses, and then they all would report to the chancellor, and then the chancellor goes up to the board of trustees. Senator Conmore, <clears throat> there are three presidents, correct? Is there, there somebody also of, uh, who does uh, Vermont Tech? Is that one, is that person? That's part of the I thought Pat Bolton, president. for some reason, was the, was the president of Unless things have changed. No, okay. Yeah. I, we have some folks from the Mosse Colleges. One president for the. Yes, sorry. Drake Turner, the director of external and governmental affairs for Vermont State Colleges. Yes, yeah, so there are two presidents. Thank Vermont you. Technical College is now part of Vermont State University. Right. Great. Thank you. Apologies. Um, so, again, the hope for at least the first provision <laughs> is that this committee, if you agree to take up the bill, would take testimony regarding the position of chancellor. And I realize there are people that feel strongly one way or the other. This was just an ask that was delivered to me. Uh, you know, my constituents asked me to put this into effect, so that's what I'm doing. And uh, I think the committee's jurisdiction here would be to take further testimony on that. And there's probably good reasons for being, having a chancellor, and there's probably good reasons for not. But that's not my view. My, my okay. view would be that that's where your jurisdiction lies. The second provision, as, as Beth mentioned, would realign the members of the Board of Trustees. There are currently five members that are appointed by the governor that sit on the board. Four trustees are elected by the board themselves, or itself, and four trustees are state legislators who are elected by the General Assembly. There's also one student trustee, and the governor is an ex officio member, I assume doesn't particularly you know, take part in a lot of the meetings, but he is technically one of the members of the Board of Trustees. So I've always looked on it as sort of 14 people that are invested in the day-to-day -day operation there. Um, my bill would reduce the number of legislative members to two. So instead of four, there would be two, and add a faculty member and a staff member uh, to take the place of the folks from the legislature that would be should the bill pass, leaving, if you will. And it, it, so it leaves the, the total still the same at 14, but uh, it would be, uh, in my view at least, a little bit more diverse membership, and I think provide some new voices 
uh, for folks on the board to hear. And the third provision would be to reduce the mandated structural deficit uh, request from the Vermont General Assembly. It was $5 million a year for five years, which is $25 million. In fiscal year 25, my bill would propose to reduce that from five to three. And then in fiscal year 26, it would finally reduce it to one and a half million, and then it would be gone. I do know that there is, and I don't want to say it's a mirror bill in the other chamber, but there is a bill which mirrors my first two provisions word for word. The third provision with regard to the structural deficit immediately takes the deficit to zero. In both fiscal 25 and 26, it would reduce it to zero and zero. So that may be, again, something that this committee would want to look at in terms of uh, should we do anything at all? And should it be three and then one and a half? Should it be zero right through? Should it be four and two? I don't, you know, you can play with the numbers, but that's that's what I came up with. So that's the uh, thrust of it. Senator Sheen. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I just want to thank you uh, for the bill. I, uh, I'm glad you're introducing this. I, the, the only piece that I'm kind of uh, don't have an opinion on yet is the uh, chancellor piece. I, I think, you know, that's something I want to hear a bit more about. Um, just voicing my support of having a faculty member and a staff member on the board of trustee. I think it's a great idea to have people who are actually you know, on the ground mm -hmm. in these colleges and air campuses on this board as well. So, so thank you for that. And the, uh, the reduction or the change in, the, um, in reducing the structural deficit, I think that's also something that's sorely needed. Um, you know, I mean, we, we had the, con as you know, we had the conversation a lot last year, and it's, it does feel strange to create this uh, requirement to reduce this deficit and then, you know, get up in arms when they're trying to reduce the deficit by whatever decisions they might be making. And then, you know, the, the press that covers this, that's, there's a connection there with the declining enrollment. Uh, so I, I do think something needs to change with how we're dealing with that deficit. And I think this is a good starting point to figure out how we revise that. So, thank you. Yeah. yeah, the rationale there was, in my view, <clears throat> it would lessen the pressure to continue to have layoffs and reduce positions, if you will. And again, the numbers you can play with. I don't know what the right number is. Is it go to zero and then no, there's no more pressure to make any more cuts? I don't know. Yeah. But, I think it's worth discussing, and again, I, I found this committee to be very fair, open, thoughtful, and uh, you know, should you decide to take it up, I'm sure you'll take uh, testimony and make decisions therein. So. Do you happen to know, Senator Collinmore, if, the, if there's ever been, you know, they did this whole study of the state colleges, I think at one point, <clears throat> do you know if they looked at the chancellor position and whether or not, uh, and, and I think this is the study that also may have produced where the the structural deficit requirement came out of. You know, if, yeah, you know, I, I don't have this any. This was like uh, the State College's 2.0 step. Optimization, Optimization plan. plan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, uh, Senator, whether there was any prior study about the Chancellor's position. Okay. Uh, certainly when Jeff Spaulding sat in that chair, we did hear predictions, if you will, that we needed to do something pretty quickly because, again, <laughs> If it, and I, I realize some people get their dander up if you call it a business, but in some ways it has to be viewed that way. I think you can't continue to run something if you have fewer and fewer customers, if you will, it, which is the way a lot of people look on students. Uh, if, if it continues to, to, to lessen, you, you run the risk of, as I think the then Chancellor Spaulding said, you run the risk of say, having nothing left. There wouldn't be anything. So his kind of warning back when, and it's probably six years ago, maybe eight years ago now, was that we needed to do something to either attract more students in, and I'm talking about a lot of like 20% increases for a while, or run the risk of, of closing everything up and there wouldn't be any more systems. So. Any other questions for Senator Collin or, or comments, gentlemen? 
And we have the new chancellor, I believe, coming in next week. Excellent. So that'll give her an opportunity. All in favor, say aye. Oh, sorry, you missed it. We did pass out two things. But. Uh, yeah, and I should say, yeah. in all transparency, this was done prior to the new chancellor of being course, hired. Of course. I, do, I don't want it to appear that we have somebody that just moved in and said, welcome, and oh, by the way, we've eliminated your position. Sure. So good luck. Right, right. Uh, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. So this was all done prior to that. Yeah. And again, I want to reinforce that this some of this came directly from the request of constituents at Castleton. And, and you know, the Chancellor, I mean, I know she's only, next week she'll have been here three weeks, but you know, sooner rather than later, I'm sure she will very much have a handle on the deficit spending requirement and yes. whether or not that makes sense or, uh, and then, um, and maybe even an opinion on the, the, the switch in the staffing piece, or the, the board piece. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Anything else for Senator Collmore? That was a great presentation, Senator Collmore. <laughs> I missed it. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. I guess I can roll the tape and watch Well, it. roll the tape too. Well, yeah. Beth, the tape. Beth St. James did a great job outlining the I did get that, yeah. So yeah. all I did was kind of flush it no, out. No, okay. yeah, no, you don't give yourself enough credit. It's, it was very good, very helpful to hear the genesis behind it. And like Senator Collmore said, several of us had a great visit to Castleton. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, for one, left very impressed. Mm -hmm. I left feeling those students could go to a million different institutions, and I was so happy that they chose Castleton. Yeah. And I thought the campus looked great. It just felt really good. So I was excited about that. OK. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. OK, committee. Uh, we have just take 10 minutes until Senator Harvey comes in to talk about libraries. Come back, we are looking at Continuing, for those of you who are watching, continuing our walk through of a series of bills. Thank you, Senator Hardy, for jumping in and uh, talking to us about S-220. And our alleged counsel, uh, Tucker Anderson, I believe, is yes, coming back. Yes, he was just back. Great. down in my committee, so he's Great, he's going, going back to Yeah. Terrific. Um, but I have the utmost confidence that you'll be able to tell us the ins and outs of this bill. Okay. So whatever you'd like to share, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, yeah, Mr. Chair. Um, I am, for the record, Senator Ruth Hardy from the Addison District. And, um, well, as you might recall, um, Mr. Chair, I don't think anyone else in the room was here, but during COVID, um, or just before COVID, I introduced a bill to create a status of libraries um, working group because I um, started in this committee. I sat right here where Senator Williams was, and I met the state librarian um, who was a super dynamic um, guy, um, Jason, and I'm blanking on Broughton. Broughton. Jason Broughton. Has left, right? Yeah. He's, yeah, he now works for the National Archives, I believe. Wow. and runs their um, uh, ABLE program that for um, people with disabilities accessing library and archive materials. He was a great guy. Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is, he's, I really want to work with, libra with librarians and libraries to figure out what's going on with um, libraries in the state of Vermont. I'm a huge library fan. I come from a, a family that uses libraries and always has. Some of my fondest childhood memories are of libraries and going to get books with my mom on Saturday morning. And I had a dear aunt who was a librarian for 60 years, um, ran a branch library in Rochester, New York. So I have a lot of really fond memories of libraries. And then when I moved to Vermont with my kids, I spent a lot of time in our library in Middlebury. So. Um, we developed a bill to create the status of libraries committee, um, Mr. Broughton and I, and um, the bill was supposed to be read on the floor on uh, Friday, March 13th, 2020. Oh. Um, but instead, we shut down the state house and everybody went home. So then when we, the next session, we came back and you were chairing the committee mm -hmm. and you all, um, well, I, you, I don't know who else was on the committee at that time, um, put the, that language into a miscellaneous education committee bill and um, created a status of libraries working group. Um, yeah, he was sitting there. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, so that working group worked for two years to do a really in-depth 
um, status of libraries. We had a lot of subcategories about what they were supposed to report back to us on, about facilities, about staffing, about um, community um, resources and programming, about their collections, about electronics and technology, all this huge amount of stuff. Um, they worked very diligently. Jason started the program, then he left to go work at the Federal Archives. Uh, they were interim librarian, and then the new state librarian, um, Catherine Delneo, who you probably have had in here at some point, or, or should, will have her in, um, has finished it off, um, and it included librarians from uh, local public libraries, from school libraries, and from academic libraries, from um, uh, colleges and universities, so all kinds of libraries and of course the state library um, and they produced a report that came out January uh, November 1st here's a hard copy of it they gave me this because I created them uh, sort of um, uh, with all of you um, and it, it's 910 pages long um, uh, but uh, 700 of them are um, is an appendix with lots of uh, public comments and lots of uh, additional information Tucker has it all completely memorized, I'm sure of it. Um, <laughs> but in this are a series of recommendations for legislative action, which is what we uh, ultimately asked them for. Um, and so S-220, the bill before you, is the bill that would implement many of their recommendations. Not all of them, but okay. many of their recommendations. Um, and you should certainly obviously hear from the state librarian who chaired the committee and other members of the committee and other members. Now, library. just out of curiosity. It's Catherine Del Neo. Oh, right. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. She's great. That's right. Um, and um, she can talk to you in depth. I also would recommend um, they did a webinar for librarians a few weeks ago and they recorded it if you're interested in listening to the webinar and they have a slide deck from that which she can probably bring to you. And then there was a really good. Um, uh, Vermont edition interview with her and a couple other librarians in December that I can send you the link to that was really helpful to listen to about this report and what they had hoped to, to um, uh, accomplish with it. Um, so I, Tucker will walk, walk you through all the language in the bill, but I'll just sort of give you a, an overview of some of the provisions and then um, leave it to him to tell you the details. But. Um, so there's a lot of findings and intent mm -hmm. in the bill, and many of those are just sort of setting out the sort of values of Vermont and its access to libraries and its values of Vermont libraries, um, and trying to cover all three types of libraries, the, the general types, the public libraries, the school libraries, and the academic libraries, um, and really setting out the sort of um, values of um, you know, principles of the First Amendment, mm -hmm. and Tucker can explain a little bit more about why this is really important, but this is really setting the stage for some of the provisions in the bill, establishing the state's values for information, intellectual freedom, use of libraries, access to materials, and um, that sort of public access to things. And then that is in the intent to protect libraries and, and why. So one of the first provisions is about licensing of electronic literary um, products um, or e-books as, as they're sort of commonly known. And libraries often, um, their contracts for e-books are often really expensive and limiting for libraries. So this not only is protecting libraries, it also, for um, those of you who might want to consider the fiscal, this saves money <laughs> because libraries are basically paying for ebooks and then they're getting a limit on the, the number of times they can um, uh, loan that ebook out even though it's an electronic thing. They're being told you can only loan this out X number of times and then they have to rebuy it even though it's electronic. So this would create contracting provisions, and Tucker can explain a little bit more because there's been some complicated tough, uh, count, uh, court cases about it. Mm -hmm. But that's what the section two of the bill is about, ebook um, licensing mm -hmm. and contracts. And that actually goes on for a little bit. Um, and then um, there is a section, did I skip something? There is. Um, 
there's, a, there's then there are provisions about book bans. Um, this is something that we've seen in lots of parts of the country, not as much in Vermont, but a couple times um, about um, people wanting to ban books from libraries for various reasons. Um, and this would not establish a ban on book bans, which is what some people wanted, but this would just establish process and procedures and values around how to handle conversations about book bans. And I really encourage you to talk to librarians about this because they were really clear that they did not want to ban book bans, but they wanted to have a framework in order to consider and discuss and approach and uh, sort of solve the issues around book bans. So they can speak to it much more articulately than me. And I think we might have a bill from Senator Chittenden on this also. Yeah, and I think, I don't know, I actually don't know his bill, but yeah. uh, Senator Kulik was also working on a bill about that, and this language was what was the sort of agreed upon language, I believe, Got it. that's in this mm -hmm. bill. Um, there's also some la uh, provisions about access um, um, and confidentiality of library records that w really brings us into the national standards for the age of patrons for, for whom for their library records are contra uh, confidential. Mm -hmm. um, and this brings us in line uh, with the 12 year standard, which is what it is the standard nationally. And again, the librarians can tell you a lot more about this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it does create a, a position at the Agency of Education for a school library consultant which is a position that was eliminated a number of years ago. And school libraries are having a really hard time because they don't have a person at AOE to help them. And when they have questions or concerns or need assistance or need to know what the standards are or need to deal with a uh, collections issue, they have nobody at AOE. So this would create a position. That was one of their recommendations. All of these were recommendations in the report. There's training and education for staff. And this would create a certificate of public librarianship that would be part of um, the functions of the Department of Libraries so that this could be a, a sort of a, essentially a, a professional development tool for the Department of Libraries for librarians. There's also language about um, public safety in our libraries. And this really brings the public libraries statutes into line with what are the public safety provisions for schools. So it makes them equivalent about um, uh, how to keep public libraries safe in the same way that we keep schools safe regarding um, drugs, alcohol, and um, uh, dangerous weapons and firearms. Um, there are some provisions about library governance starting on page 13. And this clarifies a lot of the library governance. Some of our libraries are municipal libraries. And some of them are actually uh, privately incorporated public libraries. It's kind of a weird thing. They're not, they're not technically part of the town government. They are operated by a library board, but it gets a little squirrely because sometimes towns have, yeah, library boards and they have select boards and it's unclear who the library director reports to or who oversees the budget. So this is actually clarifying a lot of the municipal statutes around library governance, and this would be really helpful for a lot of towns. Um, yes, you know, I have towns that get confused about this all the time. Um, and then um, this also um, gives the Department of Libraries the express authority to develop standards by rule. Right now, they don't have rulemaking authority, and they, so they don't have the ability to develop library standards for public libraries. Um, and they really would like to be able to, so that libraries can sort of come up to the 21st century together. Um, and this would give them the express authority to do so. They thought they would be able to do this just on their own, but as Tucker and I discovered, they actually never got the authority to do rulemaking, and so this would give them that authority. Um, and then finally, at the end of the bill, it does um, provide some uh, funding for the Department of Libraries, 275000 to the department, and then 225000 for two consult library consultants to add some staffing so that they can take carry out the duties of this bill. They, in their report, 
they have a huge laundry list of things that they would love in their dream world to have funding for. Um, they um, were in the position where they had to say, we support the governor's budget. <laughs> so I came up with this level of funding to uh, give them something so that they could carry out the bill. Um, but I leave it to you to dig into that a little bit more. There also is a huge section of the report and part of their recommendations was about data privacy. Um, and this is a really complicated issue that is not included in this bill because it is my understanding that the, there is already a separate bill that I think is right now in House Commerce, I believe, that is about data privacy more broadly, that is in the same kind of framework as recommended by the librarians. And so I didn't tackle that in the bill because it was really complicated and it would have made the bill, I think, three times longer. So Tucker can tell you a little bit more about that, um, but it is sort of being, it's, it's a separate bill that probably won't come here. I don't know where it will go, but it's, it's being held, uh, handled in commerce at this point. So that is what is in this bill. As you can tell, I'm very excited about it. I really hope that you guys will um, spend some time and, and report it out favorably and have a lot of fun with librarians who really want to tell their stories to you. Do you have a, a total cost for this? Um, so I believe that the final appropriation for the Department of Libraries is 500000 for the positions and the funding. And then the library consultant for the Department of, or the Agency of Education is, how much should we put in here, Tucker? 112000 So it's a little over 600000 is in the bill. And is um, that a fiscal note from joint fiscal or those sort of your numbers? Those were sort of the numbers yeah. that we came up with. I'm sure joint fiscal could, you know, hone them and yeah. you can talk to them. I mean, I think the Department of Libraries is, is a little bit hamstrung because they have to say, you know, we are supportive of the government, you know, the line. Completely. So, um, but I do feel like they need some positions and funding to be able to carry out this, the, some of the things in this bill and frankly to be able to support our public libraries better and to do more for libraries in the state that libraries i mean if you take a look at this report which is online um it is there's so much that our libraries do that are beyond the scope of what we sort of think of libraries and they did a lot during the pandemic for access sure. to the internet during um you know they're often the safest place in town for people to go during disasters they're they are they are often you know giving out clean you know socks and you know safe supplies and things like that they are often just the last resort for so many people and crucial for a lot of our really small towns so uh, you know anything we can do to support libraries and help them with their mission i, I think is great we lost libraries do you know how many libraries have closed over the past decade <clears throat> that is a good question i don't know i think that we have lost libraries i think we've reduce the number of hours so that there may still be a right. physical library building in some lot in communities but it's only open like six hours a yeah. week yeah. Um, a lot of them have part-time librarians the yeah. librarians are usually you know very underpaid um, and I, you know for some towns it's all they have they don't have anything else but a library right. there and um, it's really important to you know bring them back to life I feel like um, thank you I don't know if every library has this, but in Burlington, we have the Library of Things, which is so oh, cool yes. because they will loan out gardening equipment and kitchen utensils and you have to have something like appliances. That it's yeah. very it's cool. It's not just Burlington. Yeah, it's not just okay. Burlington. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My yeah. knowledge is upper. Snowshoes, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. uh, uh, right. ski passes, yeah. uh, uh, tools. Yeah. It's a really big thing. Or they have, um, in the kids' library, they often have backpacks that are sort of like mixed with games and different things for kids to take out a backpack uh, full of kind of cool surprises and stuff. So yeah, it's great. Uh, just thank you for this, Bill. Uh, just one thing to flag, uh, I imagine with section nine and 10, which involves criminal threatening and firearms, probably take a pass through judiciary, I yeah. would imagine. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. I to flag that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. thank you for flagging that. Senator Williams. So I was just thinking it may apply to Senator Machine's district too, but in my, my community, we have a lot of people from New York State because we live right on the border. Yeah. 
actually come. Well, when they come looking, they, the town <coughs> manages the budget, in our case, the money for them to operate. They come looking for more money, and of course, when in a tight budget year, they're like, well, why don't you stop, tell the people from New York State they can't come there. They won't do that. It's like, so it's, it's, I don't know if you can do anything about that legislatively, but they also, I think they have to belong to the Vermont State Libraries Association. Do you know anything about that? That I would ask the state librarian about. I don't know. Okay. Um, there is a library association, yep. and you should have them in to talk to you as well. Okay. In terms of the, um, yeah, libraries, libraries don't turn anybody away. Um, often you have to have a library card to get something, and those library cards, sometimes there's a fee to get a library card. It is true that, you know, sort of regional libraries often have people who don't technically pay to help support the library who have access. We have, I'm sure this is true in all of your districts, but some of the larger towns have the, the library and people from the smaller towns come and use those libraries even though they're tax payer money isn't funding them. So that's an issue. I mean, in a lot of states they have regional library districts actually, mm -hmm. and then branch libraries. Um, or, you know, so a library system. So you, we could contemplate something like the, you know, uh, Wyndham County <laughs> Library System and all the libraries are, part, are branch libraries of it and it's funded at the county level. Something, you know, as GovOps chair, we think about how, how to make government work a little bit better and that's something to consider. But it is it's definitely an issue um, and your community's not alone in that. Um, and it's a tough nut to crack because you don't want to turn people away. Sure. But it's also difficult to find a good library. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Is the library report link in the package for today on online? Yeah. No. Good. I can send it on to you guys yeah, later today. It would be today. helpful to okay. kind of group all this together. Yeah, I can send you a bunch of links. I got lots of links, and I can give you a list of reference of uh, uh, witnesses that I would suggest. But definitely, have your own librarians in and from your communities because they've all they all know about this. They they're they're enthusiastic. They want to see libraries get some attention. I mean, that was part of what I wanted to do was just give libraries this sort of their day in the building or their their session in the building where they get to really talk about why they're important to our communities. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Other much. questions for uh, Senator Hardy at this point? Great. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. Appreciate you thank taking you. the time, especially last minute. My pleasure. And uh, thank Mr. You Anderson, you do you want to join us at the table for a few minutes and just give us some highlights, things that haven't been covered? Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Bye, Senator. All right. Thank you for having me back again, Tucker Anderson, Legislative Council, and thank you for being merciful with the option to do the high-level overview. Yes. Uh, well, I so, think she, she kind of gave us a, a yes, good over great yeah. background. Excellent. Um, working our way from the beginning of the bill, I'm going to skip past the findings and intent, not yes. because they aren't important, yeah. but because they are. And they are supposed to be an expression of the findings of the General Assembly. So as you move forward with the bill, take a look through each one of the subdivisions that articulates a particular finding and make sure that it is an accurate representation of what the General Assembly has found on this matter. Move to page four, where there is the expression of intent. Senator Hardy flagged it, but there is legal significance uh, to this. This is uh, what a court would use to interpret all of the various provisions in this bill if it needed to be reviewed. And there are some controversial components of this that could be subject to judicial scrutiny in the future. Uh, so some of the important pieces of intent here, right at the beginning, the intent to protect libraries from contract and trade practices that interfere with libraries' duties and core missions. That is the one that has been tested the most frequently over the last couple of years. And it speaks directly to the first set of operative sections that I will highlight for you. And that is the licensing of electronic literary products. So uh, that's page four and it's section two. And I believe it goes all the way to section four, but we will get there. The high level overview of this background, uh, this has been passed in a few other states, not this language with similar proposals. It has been challenged under both uh, constitutional grounds and under the US copyright law. 
And in a few states, including in Maryland, uh, the statutes have been uh, overturned and uh, are not effective at this time. This language attempts to thread a very fine line here uh, that makes sure that it is not interfering with copyright holders' rights to sell and market their material as they see fit, uh, but that would also restrict any contract that has what is being deemed here an unenforceable provision that would interfere, for example, this is built into the section, with the library's ability to loan materials without limits on, for example, time or the number of licenses that could be issued to individual users. If you'd like me to get into detail in this section now, I can. That's kind of the high level view, is that this would establish unenforceable contract provisions that would be deemed under the law uh, unfair and deceptive trade practices. So I think we're going to have to have you back to dig into great. Yeah. yeah. And that would be enforced by the Consumer Protection Division of the Attorney General's Office. Yeah, we, if you, when you come back, I don't know if we've got time today, but if you could go over uh, in the definitions, digital, uh, audio books, mm -hmm. electronic book. Absolutely. Okay. We'll get that? into all of that. The electronic literary products is kind of the broad term there, but yeah, it would cover everything from your Libby audio book to uh, your e-books, things like that. From what I understand, there are even digital materials. Like if you've ever been, if you've ever been to the library and seen a display about books, they can even do that in a digital format. Mm -hmm. um, the next big section of the bill, Senator Hardy highlighted, bottom of page seven. This is the selection and retention of library materials. Um, locally, think of this as policies around book bans. And what this sets up is first a uh, requirement that public libraries will adopt a selection and retention policy for library materials, that the Department of Libraries would adopt essentially a standard or model policy that could be used by the local libraries. Um, and the intent here is that you would have First Amendment compliant procedures at every public library um, where if a material was under consideration for removal from the library, it would first have to pass through the procedures established in the policy before it could be removed. And that is also something mm -hmm. where you can get into a lot more detail, uh, particularly around some of the different models that have been presented and uh, if there are any constitutional concerns. Okay, continuing on, I'm on page nine now. Next section of the bill dealing with the confidentiality of library records. Uh, under current law, uh, library patron records are deemed confidential. Uh, that includes from access under the Public Records Act, and that is for any library patron who is 16 years of age or older under current law. This would amend that provision to lower that age to 12 years of age. So any library patron is 12 years or older uh, has the right to confidential library records. Is there, a, is there a problem we're trying to solve here? I'm not aware of the policy behind this. That would probably be a better question for the sponsor or some of the advocates in this area. And when you do get one of Senator Hardy's many links that includes the report from the working group, there is some discussion within the report about the merits for lowering the age to 12 versus some of the opinions. Is this from any of those to you? Uh, yeah, definitely. As to why it's uh, the sort of, uh, why it's in here. Yeah. Can you, you just, speak yeah, to yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so, because I was a librarian, as you yeah. all know, um, sometimes students in, uh, are not necessarily students, maybe they go to the public library, they want to access information on a topic that might be sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and this allows them to be, you know, to do it uh, without fear of um, 
uh, with in, in in private I guess is what I'm you know yeah. so privately accessing information that could be helpful to them that may they may feel uncomfortable divulging to someone else yeah, this is about this one's a specific parents right that's the someone that's comes so under 12 years someone. old is now first. well that's middle school grade so yeah, yeah. okay thank you do you have a question? Okay, please continue. And we have mm, five or six minutes. Okay. Yep. And then we have to shift. So I shouldn't tell stories about my public library, but I went to uh, trial. Got it. Okay. <laughs> um, the Section 7 establishes a library consultant position at the um, Agency of Education. This is spoken to specifically in the report if you want background details, but essentially it is a position in the agency that would be coordinating with public libraries material selection, policies, things of that nature. On page 10, uh, training and education for library staff. Um, the department currently has a certificate in public librarianship program. This is codifying that program, putting it in the law, saying that they are going to continue it um, and adding it as essentially to their duties and functions. It is a their credit system is um, interesting. I think it's 250 credits is what's required to get to that point. Wow. Um, don't quote me on that. I know that I'm being recorded on YouTube, but don't quote me on it. Uh, so under the public safety section, section nine and 10, as Senator Hardy pointed out, this is adding public libraries and public li library grounds to some of the statutes that cover public safety issues for public schools and that would include the carrying of a firearm on school grounds. This would include public library and public library grounds in there. There's a notable exception that is built in. This is in section 10, by the way. Sorry if I moved too fast. From page 11 and page 12. And that is if uh, it is permitted by the governing body, trustees, managers, or directors of a public library, then a firearm can be carried on to the uh, public library grounds for specific occasions or for instructional or other specific purposes. This is also built in for public schools for your under safety class would be a good example. Okay, page 13, library governance. Senator Hardy did an excellent job of explaining what this section is doing. It is eliminating some of the overlapping authority uh, where both the select board and the library board of library trustees, for example, have simultaneous authority over a library director. And this sets it so that the governing body of the library has supervision and control over the library director, not the legislative bodies of the municipalities. Moving on to page 16. Uh, big piece here relating to, uh, in section 16, the rules that will be adopted governing the minimum standards for Vermont public libraries. There are currently minimum standards for libraries adopted by rule and approved by LCAR from 1987. The intent was to update them this year However, when I researched whether they had ever been empowered by the General Assembly to adopt rules, there was no session law, there was no statute, and it appeared as though uh, it was adopted because according to those rules, it had no force of law. So it was brought, it went through the administrative rulemaking process and was brought before LCAR and passed its way through. And my assumption, this is not, uh, specifically research is that it passed through because there was no force of law attached to the rules. It was more like a guidance document than it was um, an actual rule. <clears throat> so here this codifies it, grants them the authority to adopt those minimum standards. Um, again, something to get into detail in the future. Section 17 carries the appropriations. Senator Hardy did the math very kindly for me, 500,000 to the Department of Libraries to achieve the purposes of the bill to add staff 112,500 to the Agency of Education. Um, those figures you will likely want to have fiscal analysts look at. There are a number of assumptions built into it. 
based on the median salary of similar positions in those agencies in the Department of Libraries and what the costs and benefits would be, you'll likely want to hear some financial specifics about that so that it isn't the government operations attorney making radical assumptions. Right, we'll this yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions at this point? Of course, we'll dig in a lot deeper, but I think that's a very helpful overview. Great, thank you. Committee, uh, you're going to give us 10 minutes to get ready. We have the chair of the state board coming in. We have a packet in front of us if anybody wants to take a look at it. And this is to update us on the um, search for the Secretary of Education. Welcome uh, back to Senate Education. Uh, we have with us uh, Ms. Jennifer Samuelson, who is the chair of the state board of education. And we're just going to go around the room just to, as a refresher. Thank you. Senator Terry Williams, Rutland District. Thank you. Uh, Dave Weeks, Rutland District. Our champion, Vanity County. Martine Gewitt, Chittenden Central. Uh, Not a machine, Wyndham County. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and we have you, and specifically, we have a handout right in front of us to talk about the search for a new Secretary of Education. Perfect. So, and there was a tiny little update. I slid in another um, slide hours ago. So if that hasn't been shared with you, you see uh, well, you have the more recent one in here. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm not sure, I have not looked at this. Um, one of the things that sort of, we're looking at the state board in general. Uh, we're going to have conversations about it. If you could also maybe just tell us a little bit about <laughs> not only this process, but if there's I'm trying to say this. if there's anything um, sort of government function. Uh, well, let me think. I guess maybe I'll just let you go and then I'll interrupt with questions. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> so I'm just going to look at my screen. I don't think I need to share my screen because you guys can follow along. Um, and and I'll be honest. Okay. You know, I. Uh, you would like it? No, no, no. What about the if there are Yours. observers? Oh, great point. Yes. Okay. We, we should, just in case there are people Okay. Uh, Do you want out me there. to share my screen? That would be terrific. Let me, and, well, uh, and actually, I don't have um, I'll, I'll internet. Oh, well, Mr. Work. Feldman can do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll just take a minute. Okay. We do have, we're a very popular committee. A lot of people watch. Okay. Not only in this state, but around the country. So, if you believe that. <laughs> but while he's doing that, I think it is okay for you to kick things off. Okay, sure. Um, well, what I was starting to say was, um, I'll be honest, I kind of dusted off. This was a presentation that I gave at our November monthly board meeting. Um, so slightly updated, um, just to acknowledge that you know, I'm here before you guys today. Um, and I also put in, um, I did this last year where I had the state board membership. It's changed a little bit. We've got a couple of new members. And then the other thing that I put in, um, last year I noted where everyone was from. Um, and there's, you know, good cross representation from throughout the state. Um, what I it's up there. oh, so I sent you the email to join. The oh, oh, okay. So, so then, great. So okay. if you go to your email, click on the Zoom link. I think okay. then she will be able to throw things up. Yes. Uh, the other possibility, Morgan, would be for you to just oh. throw it up. So yeah. my yeah. issue is I don't have an internet connection. So oh. I would need someone to give me. <laughs> so Morgan, why don't you throw it up on um, your computer? Please continue. So is that going to work for you to do that? Or do you want to send me the password and? Oh, do you just need a password for the Wi-Fi? Yeah. Anybody know? I don't think no, I think what you should do, yeah. if you can, if you yeah. throw it yeah. up, okay. that'd be okay. great. OK. Um, so what I added to this year is um, we have 11 members, including um, Interim Secretary of Education, Heather Boucher. But I also wrote down sort of the different capacities or you know, how we came to the board, you know, what it was that um, was relevant in terms of serving on the State Board of Education. Um, so I, if you have that, you know, I'm the chair. I'm also the chair of the Windhall School Board. I'm also an attorney. Um, Dr. Tammy Colby is a UVM professor. Um, she's also the principal researcher at um, AIR. Um, Mohammed Job is one of our newer um, full board members. He's the director of multilingual learner programs at the Louisiana School District. Gray Farron, and I'll just pop ahead to the bottom, Aaliyah Wilburn, those are our two student members. They're both new this year, so Aaliyah is just serving one year, and her term will end in June, and then Gray will continue on with us for another year. Um, Kim Gleason. How much you say where they're from? Oh, that is a good question. That's I, okay if you don't know. We're just. <laughs> 
Yeah. Um, it's fine. I, I don't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Um, I want to say Grace from Derby. That's a guess. Um, so Kim um, has a lot of history, um, both with VSBA and also a former chair of the Essex Westwood School District. She's also a substitute teacher. Um, Lyle Jepson was a former, well, I mean, he. <laughs> this is a condensed version. He was a former teacher, elementary school um, principal, high school principal, um, director of the Stanford Technical Center. Um, he's had a, a bunch of different positions. Um, Tom Lovett was a teacher and former head of school at St. John's Murray Academy. Jenna O'Farrell is also a former teacher, um, and then she was the assistant principal and principal at the St. John's Murray School. Um, and Rich Warner is the chair of the Wyndham Central Supervisor Union as well as the chair of the River Valley School District. Um, so again, sort of thinking about our geographic diversity, I think we also bring a bunch of different perspectives to the work that we do, which is great, um, because I think it, it really, in my opinion, has allowed for some really rich conversations. Um, so moving on, the State Board of Education Secretary Search Committee was comprised of myself as the chair, um, and I was joined by Lyle Jepson and Jenna O'Carroll. Um, uh, so just for clarification, sure. the whole board is not involved in the search? Ultimately they were, okay. but the way the board has been working since I've been a part of it is we've really sort of farmed a lot of our work out to committees in the first instance, okay. and then the committee comes back to the full board, and we have a full discussion. Thank and, you. Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll get to that, but that's a good question. Um, so the committee meetings, we met 11 times over two and a half months, and I kind of color-coded the steps in the process. It was really sort of like working with wet clay. You know, we, we got a letter from the governor, we had you know, two controlling statutes, and then the question was, how do we turn this into something <laughs> that will allow us to um, conduct you know, thoughtful interviews of qualified candidates and ultimately make that recommendation to the governor? Um, so the steps that we established in the process were to establish the framework, develop and advertise the job posting, draft questions and create a scoring rubric, review applications and interview selected candidates, and then debrief them after interviews. And to that, I should add, then we, as a full board, to talk about the process. And our objective was, in compliance with the statute, to recommend at least three candidates to the governor for his consideration. So the next slide really goes through establishing the framework. And I'll just, I mean, you all can read it. We, when we started this process, um, we, the first question really was, what has been done before? And what can we do better? Mm -hmm. So there, we really didn't find any information about the 2016 secretary search. Um, no agendas, no minutes. There, there wasn't really any information there. So we really relied heavily on the 2018 um, secretary search. And you know, we did have the agenda and the minutes from that. Um, that sort of formed a framework, maybe. And then from there, we looked at what we could do to make that even better. So the first thing that we did was we invited, um, really at the governor's office suggestion, um, the Department of Human Resources. And I will say that Beth Vestigi was invaluable and Keisha Pollard. Um, they really helped us to understand you know, how to go about crafting a job position. Um, they gave us um, a booklet, which became my Bible in the moment. I mean, it had everything from you know, how to create a scoring rubric, how to develop questions, which questions are better than others and why, um, how to send out letters of invitation or, you know, sorry you didn't pass the, the, the stage. It was really, really helpful. So we are indebted to them for their help. Um, the second thing we did um, was we had a public comment hearing. So this, you know, I was out on a run one day and I thought, you know what, this would be really great. Like, we would love to invite members of the public to help us because we are nine people. <laughs> and it would be great to get other thoughts and perspectives. And in that instance, we were really assisted by the Vermont um, School Boards Association, Vermont Principals Association, and the Vermont Superintendents Association because they put out an email blast to their constituents and they had two questions that they asked and then they compiled all of that information and submitted it to the board. And I, I want to say there were about 100 comments that they compiled for us, which we then you know, used as we were determining what questions to ask of, of, of candidates. Senator Gillard. 
I'm so glad you brought that up because I was going to ask that question. I felt so lucky to be able to, to reply to that survey. Um, and so I'm happy to hear that it did sort of come into play Absolutely. in the process. Great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, and then the third thing we did is before we posted the job description, and I believe this was a recommendation of um, Representative Christie, was to run the job description not just by Department of Human Resources, but also by the Office of Racial Equity. So we thought that was a really good idea. It actually you know, took a few weeks to get a response back, but I think it was well worth the wait, and it made for a much better product. So you know, we, we posted the interview, or I'm sorry, we posted the application in you know, multiple different venues. Um, we got 18 responses. And the last couple sort of came in in the last couple of days of the application period. And you know, we were happy with 18, but sort of given those last minute entries, we thought, you know, we'll push it out for another week and see if we get anyone else. And so we got one more. Um, we conducted. So, so, so um, sorry to interrupt. 18 applicants to be the Secretary of Education? Well, it ended up being 19, but yes. Okay. I mean, I just, it strikes me as, I don't know what others would think. Uh, and I realize that many people would probably see this job search and probably sort of self-identify or uh, maybe immediately recognize that they might not be qualified. But I would hope for, frankly, I would think we might have gotten more. And so it begs, where, where do we advertise? How do we? Right, right. No, I understand it's there, but you, you have to be sitting at home checking the Agency of Education website all the time to know. No, no, well, it's, oh, I'm board, sorry. Board I, board that's okay. It was okay. posted on Success Factors, School Spring, Education Week, Facebook, LinkedIn, Diversity Jobs, Indeed, Glassdoor, Career Builder, and an AOE press release. And I, and I don't know. You've, I think, probably been more involved with searches. Maybe you have as well. So I do it. But is that feel good to you guys? It's, it's, it's a small group, but it's what it is. You, know, you can't force right. the market to respond to anything. But let me just ask this. Would, you, would, I, would people have said, hey, what I might do instead is, I'm not asking that you would have done this, but maybe delegated, let's take a look at who the associate secretaries of education are in the United States, or is there a way to reach out to somebody in another state and just kind of do it that way? Or is there any kind of job, executive job search company that could have done it, you know? Well, Headhunter. Headhunter, thank you. So two things. One, the other aspect that didn't make it onto the slide was I do know that we had board members reach out to their personal contacts to say, hey, the position is open, uh -huh. you should apply. Right. Um, and I do know that that did happen. Um, so personal connection, word of mouth, I think, you know, that, and I, my sense is that that probably garnered a few of the applications that we received. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to you know, a national firm or a headhunter, that's a great question. My response is, first of all, the Department of Human Resources didn't feel that it was necessary. Okay. Um, and I believe that the Secretary of Education is the only um, cabinet level position that is not appointed by the governor. Well, that's kind of what, a little bit of what I'm thinking about is I've always believed, I've always been very public about taking this role away from the state board and allowing the, the governor to appoint his or her Secretary of Education since that individual sits on their cabinet and they should have the complete, in my opinion, hiring and firing. What we ended up with was a compromise several years ago, and mm -hmm. that's what we have that we have right now. For those of you that don't know, at one point the state board did the hiring and did the firing completely without the governor's say whatsoever. Um, mm -hmm. And now we have a bit of a hybrid, which I think many people do feel is working pretty well, where the state board does the search, puts three names forward. Um, so yeah, Senator Dula. I, I just. To piggyback on what yeah. you're saying, um, e e even in my small district in Chittenden County, I'm relatively small, uh, we hired a, a national search company to help us find our superintendent. And it, it seems as though this is a job that's big enough and important enough that it would have been, probably would have been a good decision as far as I'm concerned to have and more, we, more we help. We heard that suggestion yeah. from other members of the public. Okay. Um, However, um, again, it's a different, you know, what I understood is that this is different than hiring a superintendent because, again, it's, it's really someone that if it were any other secretary, um, 
the governor would have outright authority and wouldn't conduct, you know, probably wouldn't rely on a headhunter to, to do that work. The other thing is, we don't have the budget. We have a seventy thousand dollar budget, and that has to pay for everything. And so, um, we, we certainly did not have money for a headhunter. <laughs> when you say um, we, you mean the state board? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, and I want to assure the committee that we did get, you know, people that we thought were very well qualified. And it did, you know, lead to some really rich conversations and some hard choices, frankly. Um, and and we, we drew candidates from more than Vermont, you know, more than Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York. You know, we, we did get them, you know, from other states that were not contiguous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we, I think we got a pretty good cross-section of applicants. Um, then, moving on, the committee, at, at this point, the committee really moved more from being open to the public to moving into executive session. And so, you know, we had one meeting that was devoted to what kind of questions would we ask the candidates. Um, and, you know, I think we had a list of maybe you know, 45 or 50 questions that we whittled down to 15. Um, and then we spent some time the three of us talking about why are we asking this question? What would a model of response look like? You know, what are we trying to elicit from this question? And on a scale of one to five, what would be a five? What would be a one? Um, just so that we knew what we were looking for when we actually asked the questions. Um, so we created the scoring rubric as well. And then we also framed it, and again, this was a great suggestion from the Department of Human Resources where we ask the same questions of every candidate. I ask the same questions, Lyle asked the same questions, Jenna asked the same questions. I've never experienced an interview process like that before. Um, it was really revealing. Um, I thought that was a wonderful suggestion because it was fascinating how different the answers were. And by sort of having that prep work that we put into it beforehand, it really allowed good answers to shine. Um, and the ones that weren't as good to you know, reveal that as well. Um, after we met with all, we, we interviewed seven candidates. Um, we then had two additional committee meetings where we again met in executive session and discussed the candidates. And then we brought all of that, you know, the, the questions, the scoring rubric, and our thoughts before the full board um, at our November 15th monthly board meeting. Um, met in executive session with the full board and um, had. I mean, it was a long executive session, <laughs> um, but we came out of it, and you know, it was a unanimous decision to forward three names to the governor. So that letter went out, you know, right after that meeting on November fifteenth. And at this point, you know, we, we've done what we were authorized to do or charged to do by statute, and um, so now it's in the governor's hands. And um. The three individuals know that their names have been put forward? Correct. I, For the seven people who were interviewed, I called every one of them and said either the name had been forwarded to the governor okay. and they should expect a call from the governor's office, or they were not forwarded and, um, just to let them know. And then we also followed up with an email. And do you happen to know, I know it's not your responsibility, if the governor has interviewed the candidates? Um, you would have to ask the governor's office. Okay. My, I believe so. Okay. And that's where we're at. And that was again when? November 15th. So the governor has three candidates. We have an interim secretary. We'll reach out to the governor's office to um, better understand where things uh, lie at this point, stand at this point. Any other questions from the Samuel Center? No, Please. just an observation. It seems like a lot like two months that he, it seems a long time that nothing's come out. Yeah. Well, I got, I got two holidays, two right. significant holidays. In okay. This is a pretty high level position that's going to, I think governor's office needs the time that they need. And two months is not okay. excessive. I would, that's my respect. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Do yeah, one please. Thing. Yes. Uh, Ms. Samuelson's uh, artwork on her laptop uh -huh. is intriguing. <laughs> I'm wondering if somebody paged it. That. I would guess it was probably Monet, but um, no. I, this is more than you asked for. Um, 
all of my kids are now between the ages of 18 and 23. A few years ago, we decided instead of you know one person being Santa, we have Secret Santa. And so we switch names, and everyone has a budget, and mom and dad pay for it. But you know, one of my Secret Santa requests was I'd like a new laptop cover, and you know, one of my kids picked it out for me. Oh, very good. <laughs> I thought maybe one of your kids had painted. No. <laughs> so it sort of slides. It's a cover. Exactly. I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Okay, I see no other questions. This has been very helpful and informative. I really appreciate you coming in, and now we can follow up with the governor's office and right. see if they have any updates for us or when we might expect something.